I'm here, I'm Milan Ezzi, I work in the International Labour Organization uh, in the branch that leads the work on occupational safety and health worldwide. Uh, this is a very special year for us because we're celebrating 100 years of ILO work. It's a UN agency that deals with labor issues, um, including equality, uh, gender issues, child labor, forced labor, freedom of association, collective bargaining, and, and other issues of uh, social justice and decent work and protection, uh, protections in the world of work. And occupational safety and health is one major area um, that we've covered historically. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through, um, uh, it was an opportunity this year for us to go through the number of international labor standards that we've set in the area of safety and health, but we've also taken this opportunity to look to the future. Uh, and so my presentation, uh, I think you have copies of it. Um, I won't go into uh, too much level of detail with the limited time we have, uh, and I'm not sure if we have a three minutes questions after that, as I will not be in the round table in the afternoon, which would be late night in Geneva. Uh, so please feel free maybe to um, uh, set your questions aside and we'll see what we can manage to uh, discuss after this. Um, so there's no need maybe to remind everyone that the UN agencies work together along with their member states uh, trying to implement and accomplish the Sustainable Development Goals uh, that we've set for ourselves for, by 2030. And the ILO mainly uh, uh, functions and reports back on the SDG number 8, which is on uh, labor and decent work. And 8.8 .8 specifically is on uh, providing safe and secure working uh, conditions and places. Uh, but because we work on health, which is not the main area of work of the ILO, it's really a, a small department uh, that works in this field, uh, we do link to the Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is on providing good health and well-being uh, in general and prevention, for example, uh, of premature mortality due to exposures to hazardous substances. Uh, here, just a reminder a bit of uh, setting the scope and the statistics worldwide. We all know that over 2.8 million people die yearly uh, due to work. Uh, that means daily it's 7,500 people. And the majority of those people in this graph, we can see 6,500 die due to uh, diseases. So really, diseases is a major killer in the world of work as opposed to actual accidents and injuries. Here I have some graphs on variations in accident fatality rates um, in different regions in the world, uh, where we have some regions much higher, some because they are just highly populated, um, and, and, and some because there's a, a, a very low health service and surveillance um, system and infrastructure in place. Also here we see some of the major occupational uh, uh, diseases attributable to the world of work and we see that cancers and respiratory diseases are among the biggest across different regions and they vary very much um, with different re uh, regions and of course circulatory diseases is one of the highest linkages. Looking back, so the area of safety and health uh, is old and new relatively and it evolved over time. So the ILO was founded in 1919, which was before the creation of the United Nations League, which we joined later on after World War II. But we, we started um, protecting and fighting for the rights of workers, which was the, the first mission and mandate and constitution uh, on which the ILO is based. And one, it's, one of its first conventions and recommendations were actually tackling issues of safety and health. And the reason this happened was there were so many major industrial accidents that killed a lot of people in one go. And here I recall a bit some of the major accidents in mining, in factories, in shipping that happened even before 1919. And this is what um, shaped the mandate of the ILO when it was founded in 1919. Uh, and after the World War, uh, the, the Philadelphia Declaration uh, clearly stated uh, adequate protection for the life and health of workers in all occupations is core to the ILO's um, mandate and constitution. That was in 1944. 
What we need to understand about the ILO and its constituency is it's the only UN agency that not only brings governments to the table when making decisions, but it also calls on workers and trade unions and employers and their organizations to negotiate every decision that's made in the ILO. And our main function is to develop these international norms standards and labor standards in the area of, of work across all, all different issues. And we have over 40 instruments on tackling safety in health. Maybe in your printed version you can read uh, this table on, um, that's on the screen. But really it's recommendations that dealt with lead poisoning and anthrax in the early days and then moved on to occupational cancer, asbestos, a uh, list of diseases. Uh, and then very sector specific ocean agriculture, ocean mining and construction, uh, machine safety and guarding, working for ambient factors in the workplace, uh, including vibration, noise, air pollution, uh, moving into the more general conventions like the major convention, which, calls, which is the basis for a lot of our work, 155, and then the latest one in 2006, which was 187, setting a promotional framework for safety and health calling for strengthened national systems. So it provides like a governance map of what we should be looking at in terms of legislation, compliance mechanisms, uh, academics and uh, training institutes, tripartite bodies. Uh, and in the area of safety and health, the issue of social dialogue is really, really relevant because to affect any change, workers need to be on board uh, from early stages consulted and actively participate in all processes of setting a national policy uh, or a workplace level policy on safety and health and then a, a, pro a proper management system and other. Uh, here I list some of the risk specific conventions, the sector specific conventions and then those that encompass the main uh, principles that I mentioned. And there is a protocol of 2002 that links to the Convention 155 that deals with um, proper reporting and recording of occupational accidents and diseases, which in these days everybody talks about indicators. How do we measure that? How do we measure this? How do we ensure impact? How do we ensure uh, effectiveness of our activities? And, and this is uh, um, uh, the only indicator really that we've been using is you know, a decrease or increase in accidents at work, a decrease in increased fatalities, non-fatalities, or an increase in diseases, which is not always easy to measure if governments uh, don't have a system in place to re report and record accidents and diseases and report them to their relevant ministries and have proper registries kept up to date that are harmonized um, nationally across different you know, social security uh, standards or hospitals or other services that actually collect data in this area. So the protocol was created to provide some sort of standards but has not been highly ratified because it's highly technical and setting up this infrastructure is not easy for the developing world. Uh, here I, I recall a bit, so in addition to these international labor standards, made of conventions and recommendations, conventions which are binding. Uh, so every country or member state which ratifies this convention is under the duty of translating the provisions of such convention into their national law. Uh, and then the recommendations that come with it are, are just the guidelines and guidance that countries can benefit from. But in addition to this normative and more binding um, approach, we do develop codes of practice which are highly technical, which take also years in to make, and also are based on tripartite discussions. So not all our standards are the most sophisticated ones and the highly you know, um, developed uh, uh, measures that uh, there are countries in the world that supersede um, the standards that we call on, but these are minimum standards and minimum requirements that the tripartite body has agreed on after negotiation and consultation and that we think uh, this is the minimum companies and member states should be following. And these codes of practice cover various areas. And after World War uh, II, uh, World War I, uh, there were major industrial accidents also that continued to happen, including Bhopal in India, which uh, many of you have heard of, Silvestro, Chernobyl, mining industry most recently, and the Rana Plaza in Bangladesh where um, a garment factory completely collapsed 
Uh, and, and these major accidents attract a lot of international media and call on global supply chains and private sector to take action um, to protect their names most of the time, but also to play a social responsibility role in this uh, global arena. But because if you say that workers die every day in every place or suffer chronic diseases or suffer injuries that are not necessarily fatal, it's not as it's not a good advocacy um, tool uh, to change legislation or to invest resources. But these accidents, because they you know attract so much media, the deaths are you know once um, it's like an attack. It looks like an airplane crash. They attract much more media, and we build on this to to encourage the world um, to provide better protections and proper legal frameworks and activities and, and trainings, etc. Uh, and and after Chernobyl, we started thinking of this prevention, culture of prevention, because it was always about protection. Or when accidents happen, we react. And this culture of uh, preventing uh, things before they happen started to evolve. Uh, after the latest accident to see what is a sustainable way that we can actually um, prevent harm in the future. Um, and uh, we have so many different um, areas of work at the ILO. Obviously, the standards, codes of practice, and publications. But there are so many different fora where we have global campaigns, such as the World Day for Safety and Health at Work, where each year we celebrate a different topic. We, are, we have started working on the 2020 topic, which is going to be violence and harassment in the world of work, which is the first convention in the world that's on violence and harassment in the world of work. And this includes psychological harassment, sexual harassment, and uh, physical violence, of course. And this convention just came out two months ago in June, uh, and our branch will be very active in promoting its ratification and producing new research and guidance uh, in this area that's very much linked to safety and health of workers. Uh, and we will see later how um, especially psychological harassment at work uh, can be a major issue. Uh, we also have different uh, uh, publications, obviously, and training guides. Uh, these are some of the checkpoints for the economic sector, uh, how we can make national plans and profiles and systems on safety and health, uh, integrated health promotion approaches that link uh, nutrition to physical activity, psychosocial risk prevention, tobacco and substance abuse in the workplace. Um, so they vary a lot in, in focus. Um, and as we cover the developing world, uh, we have a lot of easy to use practical guidance for small enterprises. And now we've developed a lot of those as applications on our own phones. Uh, we do have the World Congress happening every three years, and many of you may know about it and, and visit it. And it's different collaboration with different host countries every three years. And it sets sort of a higher agenda to the priority thematic areas that we need to deal with in safety and health. And a number of times we've signed high-level declarations like the one in Seoul uh, in 2010, uh, 2009, sorry, uh, that where we bought, we had a ministerial summit and we had signatories from private sector companies and ministries committing to raise safety health on the agenda. Another one was signed in Turkey a few years after that. Um, so today we face new new challenges, which are not necessarily new, but they keep evolving as you know the, the pace of the changes keep uh, growing faster and faster. One area is technology that everyone these days is very interested in, and the introduction of digitalization, ICT, to the way we work and how work has become virtual. Um, and people telework, they work from different spaces, we're using smart technology, um, detecting, wearing different um, devices that detect the, that could be positive or negative in, in, for safety and health. Um, there are, of course, opportunities and challenges for each of these um, issues, uh, and they have prevented a lot of very dangerous jobs from workers being exposed to these dangers. Uh, at the same time, there have been new psychosocial risks, for example, introduced. There are new chemicals and biological risks introduced with these new technologies, um, even physical risks by working alongside robots and other. Uh, and this is more an explanation of automation and robotics, which is part of this technology um, field. Cybersecurity risks is another issue. 
um, and then this reliance on automation um, can cause um, lots of uh, unanticipated risks, uh, ergonomic risks in the way we work, and, and they are very, we used to have ergonomic risks, now they're very different in the way we sit and work and musculoskeletal diseases that may arise from all these exposures. Um, and again, for robotics and, and uh, automation, there are similar opportunities and challenges, and we need to be able to make the most of these technology and not shy away, of course, and resist, uh, because this is happening, whether we like it or not. There are so many questions that relate to the social welfare of workers, of course, the question of uh, workers being replaced or not, or um, by these technologies, or how best we can actually use them to our benefit to protect the health and support the health of workers. Nanotechnology is another area. It's nothing new, but it's used more and more. Exposures are not yet detected as we would like. Um, a lot of the different production lines now rely on uh, nanotechnology, and we know very well the health impacts, including um, uh, oxidative stress and inflammation and really uh, dermatological damages and other tumors that may arise to exposure um, to nanoparticles. And so that is another area that you know, research institutes need to be looking closely at, and they have. Um, but again, a lot of our work is trying to make sure that the developing world is up to date and that we don't outsource uh, the waste we produce in, in developed countries to the developing world. Another major issue that's changing worldwide is obviously demographics. Uh, the workforce is changing. Um, in the years ago, women were not part of the workforce, and now they are, and that has implications on work-life balance, on families, and, and, and also on the risks that could um, have uh, negative effects on reproductive health and other. Uh, young workers and aging workers require very specific, obviously, attention. Um, young workers also are much more vulnerable to many of these risks, uh, have, don't have the expertise or necessarily the training and competence, and uh, are willing to take a lot of risks, uh, sometimes just by the virtue of being young. Uh, and older workers have different needs to stay in the workforce um, and, and suffer more uh, medical issues that need to be in the workplace and uh, uh, workstation need to be, needs to be accommodated uh, to adjust uh, to the various needs of, of these uh, uh, older workers. Again, uh, gender is another issue, uh, and while more women have entered the workforce, uh, there continue to be obviously unequal wages and other issues that um, uh, make women practice more uh, diverse forms of work and uh, temporary employment and precarious types of employment uh, to be able to manage the home and the workplace, um, which does not necessarily reflect uh, great on their health. Migrant workers are another population we look into, and they are on the increase, and um, they have less and less rights um, in some countries, and they have less access to information in a language that they actually understand. Um, they have less protections and, and legal coverage in a lot of the, the legislation in a number of countries, and they tend to be in the dirty, dangerous jobs that nobody else wants to do. Uh, moving into sustainable development, that's also had an effect on safety and health. So climate change, air pollution, and environmental degradation are something that the ILO also is looking uh, at, and these changes uh, are quite considerable. Uh, well, some of them are, have always been there for people who work in tropical areas, obviously people who work on construction sites in um, areas like the Gulf countries where heat is an issue, and, and the way to manage that um, is really dependent on the national policies and regulations in place and then the compliance mechanisms that come with that in terms of uh, taking breaks uh, and, and how much heat stress can play a bigger role in affecting other occupational exposures that you would have had in making them worse. Obviously, we've heard of the higher temperature increase in the next century, uh, and that will, for us, it's an economic issue, obviously, because there will be an increase in loss of jobs um, uh, but also a change in jobs that people will do, and then a uh, greater effect on their various occupational exposures and the burden that they will be carrying. Uh, the green economy 
uh, is a huge department in the ILO where we're trying to have greener workplaces. But this is just to be careful that just because they're greener doesn't mean they have other safety and health, uh, they don't have other safety and health concerns like working in the wind turbine sector where you're now exposed to different solvents and uh, chemicals that were not there in other uh, processes uh, before. Same for solar energy um, and uh, manufacturing fluorescent light bulbs and exposure to mercury. Um, recycling, e-waste, and the various exposure across the e-waste chain. Um, so we need to look closely when we say we're you know, promoting green technologies, but those also have a positive and negative impact on the safety and health of workers. A lot of you may know, of course, the changes in work organization. So the ILO has moved from what we call precarious work to what we call non-standard forms of work. And as of a few weeks ago, we're now calling them diverse work arrangements. Um, obviously, we're a tripartite organization, so when we set the term non-standard forms of work, the employers found this very negative, and of course, because they are uh, pro-deregulation, uh, they prefer terms that are much more, um, let's say, softer, like diverse work arrangements. Uh, these are internal battles uh, that the ILO and our constituents have to face uh, through our governing bodies, through, through our international labor conference, to make sure we don't really undermine the standards and values moving forward, at the same time keeping employers and governments and workers on board to discuss and negotiate. Um, and so it's always a struggle of what the position of the ILO is um, in a lot of these areas because of this push and pull. But, I mean, it, I just find it funny, you know, one, all our reports said precarious employment a few years back, and then we were not allowed to use the word precarious anymore because it was too negative. And then it was non-standard, and now that's too negative, and now we're diverse work arrangements, which doesn't reflect really the negative working conditions that workers find themselves in, and, and the need to push for uh, more protection um, in this area. Uh, obviously, there are opportunities and challenges. Working on platforms is like in the old days, piecemeal work. Uh, and that used to be considered very precarious. And now it's just, you know, it's sold as the next best thing because now women, for example, can work from home and, and juggle 500 things and they actually can have access to work which they couldn't because they didn't have childcare or family care um, uh, support. Uh, but these are mixed, mixed messages, of course, because that's created more stress. Um, uh, to deliver and to manage and blur the lines between what's work, what's life, and what's the home. Um, and these are just thoughts and things that we need to be considering moving forward with all these changes um, in work organization. Uh, finally, uh, so I won't take too long, uh, thinking through all of these, the ILO proposes a few uh, measures moving forward. Uh, we want to discuss the idea of not just protecting workers and then not just preventing uh, risks and hazards, but anticipating uh, new OSH risks moving forward into this world. The other issue is that the, the, the profession of safety and health has evolved. So we can't sit in silos as an occupational hygienist or industrialist or uh, an, an occupational health nurse or psychologist. We need to be all working together, not just within our various environments, but reaching out to law, to technology, and design, human resources, and all aspects now play a key role um, in, in tackling the various and complex issues uh, that, that impact the safety and health of workers. Uh, but also there's a continued need to build competence. We see in the developing world, sometimes it's just a lack of knowledge, the lack of understanding that small changes or housekeeping even changes can make a big difference in preventing uh, accidents and risks. And, and trainings in the right way, at no cost, at the right time, can make a big, big difference. Uh, and we've sort of lost that competence uh, in many contexts in the world of work, and, and we feel that mainstreaming, this is nothing new, uh, issues related to safety and health, even at the school level, and vocational training is essential, so that slowly it does become a culture of safety, and not that we only professionals on OSH understand what that is. And even internally at the ILO, there's a lot of ignorance to what, so people use the term OSH, you know, as if it's a table, a, a door, 
but nobody understands what's behind this field that's huge. So it links to public health, it links to diseases, it links to engineering, it links to so many disciplines, and especially today, mental health at work and human resources and management and law that needs to uh, manage these issues are critical uh, for the workforce to continue in any sense, in any sustainable way, because it's very easy to have everyone work 20-hour shifts and be connected to their phones all day and then lose them within a year, lose your expertise, having to train others, um, uh, and then having that cost on your healthcare. Uh, so th this long-term thinking is very absent because it's not something you can see directly and it's not something linked to the process of production and profit directly. So the first jobs after the crisis in 2008 to be uh, removed uh, or made redundant were safety and health professionals that were seen as something secondary to the profit machine. So linking to public health is another area we're considering and uh, the reinforcing our international labor standards and promoting ratification of these standards that do provide a really minimum uh, standard of protection and prevention for workers worldwide. Uh, and working with private compliance mechanisms uh, and public uh, uh, relationships uh, across the supply chains is very important reminding of the duty of bigger companies to support smaller companies, of uh, people who trade across the world and the various standards they need to abide by even if it's in countries that have lower legislative requirements. Uh, and we would like to continue to reinforce the role of workers employers and uh, governments uh, in moving this issue forward, of course. So um, I, this, this is just more explanation you have in your uh, presentations, I guess, uh, detailing each area and how we wish to go about uh, working on it. Um, a few things I wanted to mention uh, moving forward also is that the ILO uh, in its International Labour Conference 2016, uh, 2019, this June, uh, just adopted a declaration. So we don't adopt declarations every year, it's a big thing. Um, and it was a declaration on the future of work. And in that declaration, we recognize that safety and health is fundamental to decent work. And we also recognize the basic protections include uh, minimum wa adequate wages, uh, um, non-excessive working times, uh, and safety and health are the labor guarantee package that uh, the ILO will be promoting. Um, we, this is also another problematic area, and internally there was no agreement to announce safety and health as a fundamental principle and right at work. It was hours and hours and nights of discussion. We thought it was going to go positively, but it didn't. But fortunately, next to the, uh, like in addition to the declaration, there was a resolution that our governing body in the coming year and months is going to discuss how we can make safety and health a fundamental principle right at work, which has many implications and which then uh, allows that each member state, by virtue of being a member state of the UN, of the ILO, will have to make progress in the area of safety and health and report back yearly on the progress made in the area of safety and health. So it is a big deal because the other areas that have been considered fundamental like freedom of association, elimination of child labor, non-discrimination and forced labor uh, elimination have taken a higher, you know, they have received more resources, have taken a higher level of commitment on political agendas worldwide by virtue of being a fundamental principle, recognized as a fundamental principle. So this is a struggle that we would need support from all member states moving forward um, in, in recognizing, which for me is a basic. So if you don't have the right to life, the right to health, you cannot enjoy any other rights. So it is the foundation but there's always resistance from employers because it requires, in their opinion, much more resources to be put in this area and much more regulation that they would like to avoid, obviously. So it's a process of working together with our constituents to, to move this issue forward. There are so many other issues, but I guess, I mean, this is uh, you. I'm happy to receive any questions eventually or even through email. And I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, everyone, uh, and the universities 
uh, for being patient and listening to us. And I apologize again that we cannot be present in person, which we would have liked. And uh, I say hi to all the other speakers, a lot of whom I know very well. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you.